Avrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, we love you, and we adore you. Lord, I thank you for this Shabbat, for this uh, beginning of Sukkot as we enter in to, uh, to, to this awesome and powerful feast, this uh, Moed, this appointed time that you have set up for us to see your might and glory in a new mighty and powerful way each and every year as we remember where we came from, as we remember who you are and what you have in store for us. B'Shem Yeshua Meshachim, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen. If you have your scriptures, go ahead and open up to Leviticus 23. Uh, we're going we're gonna to kick things off right out the gate with the passage that brings about the, the idea of Sukkot and what we're doing, why we're doing, how we're doing, etc. Uh, but Leviticus 23, beginning with verse 4, 33. Uh, I actually had thought about putting slides together for this so that you could follow along on the screen, and then I remembered why I don't use slides with uh, the passages, because I want you to actually show up with your Bibles. So uh, <laughs> I want to, to make you lazy. We're going to have you actually bring it. Uh, no, uh, verse 33 of Leviticus 23 says, Adonai spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Bnei Israel and say, On the 15th day of the seventh month is the feast of Sukkot for seven days to Adonai. On the first day, there is to be a holy convocation. You are to do no laborious work. For seven days, you are to bring an offering by fire to Adonai. The eighth day will be a holy convocation to you, and you are to bring an offering by fire to Adonai. As a solemn assembly, you should do no laborious work. So right out the gate, we recognize that Sukkot begins on the 15th day of the month, uh, the seventh month, month, which is exactly five days after Yom Kippur, 15 days after Rosh Hashanah. So we wrap up the, uh, the, the days of awe, the 10 days of awe, and we immediately roll right into uh, Sukkot. And Sukkot's a really cool thing because it's there to remind us of our journey in the wilderness and how we live back then because it's really easy to become comfortable when our lives aren't in tents in the wilderness and the desert covered in muck and grime and, and road dirt uh, and uh, and eating from you know whatever happens to be on the ground in the morning when you wake up the manhu the the what is this um, the manna that's what the, the actual Hebrew translates to manhu what is this um, the, you can imagine every morning what is this um, <laughs> But no matter how comfortable we get, you know, you open your refrigerator up in the morning and there's eggs and there's vegetables and you got all the, the, the need to make omelets is right there and you don't have to worry about it. There's milk, there's coffee, there's whatever you want uh, and coffee uh, all ready to go right there. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it. It's all there and it's easy to become comfortable. But then Sukkot rolls around every year in which we're commanded to live in, su in a sukkah for seven days to remember where we come from. We continue in verse 39. So on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the first fruits or the fruits, sorry, of the land, uh, you are to keep the feast of Adonai for seven days. The first day is to be a Shabbat rest and the eighth day will be also a Shabbat rest. On the first day, you were to take choice fruit of trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy uh, trees and willows of the brook and rejoice before Adonai your God for seven days. This is where we get the idea of waving the lulav and the etrog is from this passage. We take those four species which were found in Eretz Israel and the land of Israel and we wave them before the Lord uh, each and every year on Sukkot. You are to celebrate it as a festival to Adonai for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it in the seventh month. You are to live in Sukkot for seven days. All the native born in Israel are to live in Sukkot so that your generations may know that I had, be, had been a Israel to dwell in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Adonai, your God. Now, here's what I actually want to focus on tonight, because I think this is such a powerful image. One of the greatest concepts, one of the most integral concepts in Judaism is that of Lador Vador, which literally means from generation to generation, that we are to pass down our faith, our uh, uh, way of practice, our way of life, our customs, everything that we do from generation to generation. It's not just teaching our children how to lay to feel in. It's not just teaching our children how to wear a lead. It's not just teaching them how to say Kiddush and uh, how, to, how to turn to the East for the Shema and so on and so forth, but it's actually interacting with them in a way that they want to take a part in it. They want to be a part of it. They want to take side in it.
in it. We see the same idea with uh, Passover, uh, Pesach, which is the first of the three uh, Shalosh Regalim, the first of the three pilgrimage feasts. We're commanded to observe Passover every year in such a fashion that we will not only be imagining ourselves having gone through the Exodus ourselves, but that our children will ask, why do we do this? And why do we do that? And why do we eat this? And why do we eat that? And it forces us every single year uh, to have this opportunity to express to our children, to the next generation of God's miracles and his wonders and his might and his power and how his love endures forever and right. ever, as the Hallel Psalms say. And so here in uh, Leviticus 23, with the discussion of Sukkot, we see the same image again. He says, you are to live in Sukkot for seven days so that, uh, he goes on, he says, you are to live in, uh, you are to celebrate it as a festival, verse 41, to Adonai for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it in the seventh month. You are to live in Sukkot for seven days. All native born in Israel are to live in Sukkot so that your generations may know that I had been Israel dwell in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. The reason we're to live in a sukkah isn't because it's fun to put a sukkah up. As a matter of fact, if you're doing it in South Alabama at three o'clock in the afternoon in the middle of September, the last thing it is is fun. Amen. It is hot. I mean, smoldering. We were drenched. Uh, you know, some of the guys out here looked like they had wet themselves. There was so much sweat. It's not even funny. Uh, but yet here we are putting the sukkah up. Here we are every year decorating the sukkah and spending time under it. We'll be camping out this weekend. And for the love of God, I pray. <laughs> that we get a breeze of cool air yeah. that comes through. Rumor yeah. has it it might be in the mid-60s this weekend. We'll find out. Uh, a couple of years ago when we first did the, the camp out here for Sukkot, uh, it was really hot during the day. And then all of a sudden that first night it dropped into the 40s out of nowhere. Nobody was prepared. Uh, it felt awesome when it started. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, all you heard was teeth chattering everywhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and that's when you quickly learn that, that you know, the, the character trait of, uh, of, of Judaism, uh, one of them is that we, we are, are known for being grumblers and complainers. The Bible calls us that over and over and over again. You know, you <laughs> stiff-necked people, you're always complaining. Um, and it's amazing because uh, we will complain when it's hot, and I have found out we will also complain when it's cold. <laughs> and we'll complain anywhere in between. And it filters over in a Messianic synagogue. We're not just Jews. We're Jews and Gentiles who come together to worship uh, the, through Messiah. And as we come together, it filters over. And, and apparently, some of the Gentiles start to pick up that, that character, uh, uh, perhaps character flaw. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But we, we start to pick up that character and we start to complain. And so it's, it's funny as we do this, but, but it's interesting because the Lord commands us to build the sukkah. He commands us to live in the sukkah, not because it's fun. Although he does say it's a season of rejoicing. It's a season of simchatenu. It's a season of your joy. Uh, but it's not for you as adults. It's for your children. And when they grow up and do it, it's not for them as adults. It's for their children, and so on, and so on, and so on, as we move from generation to generation. It is so that our children will ask, but why? Like, we got AC in the house. We got comfortable mattresses in the house. Why do we have to sleep under the stars? Why do we have to risk getting wet? Why do we have to sleep on the ground? Why do we have to do all of this? Why can't we just go inside? And it's so that we can remind our children of God's might, of his power, of his glory, of his provision. You know, it's really interesting when we look at Sukkot because it's a reminder of our wilderness journey. Well, if we look at the wilderness journey, the one thing that we can depend upon in the wilderness journey is that Israel, everything they had came directly from the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. The Lord made sure that their shoes didn't wear out for 40 years. They walked on the same pair of shoes. I can't get a year out of a pair of shoes, generally speaking. The Lord says that he provided the clothes on their back to maintain for 40 straight years. Uh, it, it's unimaginable the things that he did they walk out their front door and there's the 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 man who that provided the bread that they made and ate uh the the lord brought quell in for them to eat even when they grumbled and complained he brought quell in for them to eat and provided for them in that way he provided water for them he provided everything everything they needed and the second generation of israel the first generation all they remembered was the provision of egypt and they were constantly comparing what they saw as hardships in the wilderness to what they uh misremembered uh to, to quote politicians what they misremembered uh about their experience in egypt all they could do was put the to compare the two but the second generation that ended up going into the promised land all they knew was god's provision they didn't know egypt's provision they didn't know egypt providing food and meat and, and room and board all they knew was 
was what God provided in the wilderness. And I truly believe when they crossed over into the promised land, that's why it was that much easier for them to just follow what God said when he said, go and take the land that I've given you. Because all they knew was God gives, God provides, God. But he says the time will come where you will become comfortable. And when you become comfortable and you forget about what you experience, and I think that's why he says right out the gate here in Leviticus 23, when you come into the promised land and things start going well and you see my promises become fulfilled, you are to build a sukkah for seven days. You're to live in it every single year on the 15th day of the seventh month. You're to live in it for seven days so that you never forget where you came from. And it's a humbling reminder. It's a humbling reminder of what the Lord has brought us to and from. We go to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter eight, verse 13. Uh, Nehemiah is at a period in time where Israel is coming back to the promised land and they're starting to find their way again and realize the mistakes they made that caused them to get kicked out of the promised land and, and to dwell in the Babylonian Galut, the, the diaspora and the Babylonian uh, captivity for, for the time period that they did. And now they're coming back and they're trying to kind of feel their way around again and figure things out. And the, the walls of Jerusalem being worked on and the temples being worked on and all these things are going on. And they're trying to figure out how to maintain Jewish life again, back in the promised land, back in the promises of God. And it says here in verse 14, 14 of Nehemiah chapter, Chapter 8, they found written in the Torah. So they began out by going back to the Word of God. How about we open up the Word and let's see what it says and see if we can figure out where we messed up at. They found written in the Torah that Adonai had commanded through Moses that B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, should dwell in Sukkot during the feast of the seventh month, so that they should proclaim and spread this message in all their towns and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the hill country and bring olive branches and wild olive branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of other leafy trees to make Sukkot. Just as it is written, so the people went out and they brought branches and made Sukkot for themselves, each on their own roof, in their courtyard, in their courtyards of their houses, a house of God, uh, in the plaza before the water gate and in the plaza uh, of the Ephraim gate. The entire assembly would, who would, had returned from the captivity made Sukkot and dwelt in the Sukkot since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until the great day, B'nai, that great day, uh, I'm sorry, until that day, B'nai Israel had not done so. And the joy was very great so let that sink in since the days of joshua right the lord says when you go into the promised land and you start to see my promises fulfilled then every year on the seventh month on the 15th day you were to build a sukkah and live in it so that you remember what you since the days of joshua since the days they first went into the promised land just to let this settle in for a moment so you can can start to picture how long this has been the tabernacle stood in Shiloh in Samaria and what we know Samaria today in the north of Israel before it ever moved to Jerusalem, before David ever brought it down. The tabernacle itself stood in Shiloh for 370 some odd years. From just after we go into the promised land till David finally begins to build, or I'm sorry, uh, David brings it down and Solomon begins to build the temple. 370 some odd years that the tabernacle stood in Shiloh plus the time that David uh, was on the throne and that Solomon was on the throne and so on and so forth until the Babylonian captivity, until they come back 70 years later after being taken out of the promised land to the Eretz Israel again to reestablish Jerusalem and the promised land. Not a single generation of the nation of Israel since the days of Joshua had celebrated Sukkot as the Lord commanded. And why did the Lord command it? So that when you become comfortable in his promises, you don't forget what was on the other side of his promises. You don't forget where you came from. And why did we get taken out of the promised land? Because we became complacent and we forgot where we came from and how great our God is because of what he brought us from and through. And as believers, it's way too easy for us to find ourselves in the same situation. We forget about as things are going well for us and our spiritual lives are blossoming and blooming and everything's going well. It's really easy to forget about the trials and tribulations until something happens that forces you on your knees. Like we've been praying for Clayton until something happens that forces you on your knees and you realize how terribly you need the presence of the Lord and his provision and how easy it is to forget about it when things are going well, but how absolutely necessary it is that we hold on to it, especially in those days. And so he says here, not since the days of Joshua had they celebrated this day after day from the first day to the last day, he read from the scroll of the Torah of God. So they kept the festival for seven days. And on the eighth day, according to the regulation, there was a solemn assembly. So for uh, all of this time, right, they were out of the promised land for 70 years. So for at least four, <laughs> almost 500 years, Sukkot wasn't celebrated in the promised land as God had commanded. 
all of a sudden, now a new generation is learning Lador Vador about Sukkot, is learning from generation to generation, a new generation, especially Nehemiah's children and their children are going, but dude, we've never seen this before. What is this? Why are we, this is weird. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing it? Why are we sweating, putting this thing up? Why are we living under it? And in Israel today, it's really neat. You go to Israel today during Sukkot and there are sukkahs everywhere everywhere a buddy of mine and his family spent almost a month in israel last year uh, on sabbatical he's a rabbi uh, also a messianic rabbi also he spent almost a month in, in israel and they went to pizza hut and you know all of the restaurants have sukkahs set up outside and they went to pizza hut and ate their lunch under the sukkah in front of pizza hut with pizza hut labeling all over the place and all this kind of stuff uh i mean everywhere there's sukkot everywhere on the the patios and on balconies and on rooftops and everywhere you look there's a sukkah everywhere and everybody takes it to heart because you know what this generation in the promised land remembers what it was like outside of the promised land. Often people that are not even religious in Israel are celebrating Sukkot and living in a sukkah and being reminded of God's provision and his promises. We go to Zechariah 14, beginning with verse 16. Zechariah 14, verse 16, a phenomenal prophecy here about the days to come. It says, then all the survivors from all the nations that attack Jerusalem will go from year to year to worship the king Adonai Tebot and to celebrate Sukkot. Oh, but Rabbi, people tell me all my life that we don't have to celebrate the Moedim anymore, that the Jewish feasts don't matter anymore, that the Levitical uh, uh, observances doesn't matter anymore seems to, to matter to Yeshua in these days. What about the gap in between? Why is it it doesn't matter all of a sudden and then it does all of a sudden? That doesn't make sense. And then he goes on to say, furthermore, verse 17, if any of the nations on earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king Adonai Zebod, they will have no rain if they don't go up when? During Sukkot. This is during the millennial. He says, if the nations don't come and worship me during Sukkot, if they don't come to Jerusalem to celebrate Sukkot, they will suffer. And if we read the way it's described, it's the exact same message is spoken to Israel if they walk away from the Lord's ways. You go back to the blessings and curses of Deuteronomy, it's the same narrative of what would happen if we walk away from the blessings and promises of God. If the Egyptians do not go up and celebrate, they will have no rain. Instead, there will be the plague that Adonai will inflict on the nations that do not go up to celebrate Sukkot. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not go up to celebrate Sukkot. And look, it's no more important now than it was then, back during Israel's days in the promised land, as it will be in the future for us, Lador Bador, from generation to generation, to make sure our children understand what's happening. If you don't believe me, go to Mark chapter 10, verse 13. Mark chapter 10, verse 13. Now, people were bringing little children to Yeshua so he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Yeshua saw this, he got angry. He told them, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So if the kingdom of God belongs to the children, how much more important is it that the children witness the kingdom of God be lived on and in on this planet today? How much more important is it that the children to whom the kingdom of God uh, uh, belongs to witnesses us celebrating Sukkot and Pesach and Shavuot so that they can ask us, why do we do this? So that we can say, well, we build a sukkah because our forefathers lived in the wilderness in a temporary dwelling place for 40 years. And this is where we come from. We build a sukkah to remind us of the tabernacle, the temporary dwelling place, the mishkan, that our heavenly father's presence dwelt in in the wilderness as Israel journeyed around. As, he, as his presence dwelt in for 370 some odd years in Shiloh before being brought down to Jerusalem. Uh, we can remember the fact that there's this temporal dwelling place that the Lord desires for his presence to exist in, which is a foreshadowing of his presence <laughs> residing in our hearts. Because we are a temporary dwelling place. I truly believe, and this is my thing, if you don't agree with it, life goes on. But I truly believe that one of the worst mistakes that my forefathers, the, the people of Israel, ever made was building the temple. Because God never asked for a permanent dwelling place. He asked for a temporary dwelling place. Particularly, he asked for a temporary dwelling place where his presence led us when we journeyed. Where his presence led us into battle. Where his presence paved the way. And then we built a permanent dwelling place. We build a temple and we put his presence over the ark inside of a, a stone walled room. And then we wave to him and say, all right, we're going to go off the war now. We'll come back and see you when we're done. All right, we're going to go on a journey now. We'll come back and see you when we're done. We'll come back to you. Don't worry until ultimately we don't come back. We don't come back. We don't come back. But the tabernacle was a reminder. It was a foreshadowing. It was an emphasis on the reality of what we are to be. 
as the people of God. We are to be the tabernacle, the mishkan, the temporary dwelling place of his presence, of his shekhinah, of his glory. And the power and presence of his ruach HaKodesh, his Holy Spirit in our lives. So sukkah not only reminds us of what Israel experienced in the wilderness, but what we are to be as a temporary dwelling place for his presence. Mm -hmm. And how much more important is it that we heed, Paul, heed Paul's words over and over again to avoid immorality and to stay away from everything that the world does so that we can remain clean, righteous, and holy in the presence of God. And then he goes on, uh, Amen, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child. You ever watch a kid when the sukkah is going up? You, you, you want to see joy and excitement? You see the kids run up on stage for the plush Torah scrolls in our Torah service that take part in the procession. You want to see excitement? Tell them they're going to camp out with all their friends at the synagogue on Sukkot. Our kids have been all over the place with excitement uh, about the opportunity this weekend to camp and to, to be able to stay out here and asking all sorts of questions. What's this for? And what's that for? And why do we do this? And why do we do that? And it's an opportunity for us to relay it to our children and for us as adults who so easily get tied down to the mundane, who so easily get tied down to the day in and day out, and we lose focus on the joy and the excitement of this. And we start complaining because it's hot while we're building, or we start complaining because nobody's helping, or we start complaining because there's so much work to do, or we start complaining because we've got to do this and we've got to do that, and we've, we can't rest, we can't enter this rest because we've got too much happening. And then we watch our children and the joy and the excitement. And as much as it's there for Lador Bador from generation to generation to learn, it's not literally just for my generation and my children, but I, as the generation, and to watch that generation. As they ask questions and it's my turn to go, you know what, that's true. Hey God, why do we do this? And why do we do that? Remind me again of how your mercy endures forever. Why am I putting up a silk? Oh, Lord, remind me again of how your loving kindness endures forever. Lord, remind me again of how important it is for us to praise you. And to glorify your holy name because everything that we have comes from your provision. Sure, we work for it. Sure, we work for it. Fine, whatever. But, but it comes from you. Our employer's paycheck to us doesn't bounce because you provided the means. Our bills are paid because you provided the means. Our lives are relatively all right because you provide the means. We have everything we need, everything we could ever imagine needing because God provides and meets the needs of those that love him. And Sukkot reminds us of that. And so not just our little children get to ask why. Why do we do this? Why do we do that? And get to hear the story. But we get to be reminded as we relay the story and as we watch the joy and the glee and the excitement in our children's eyes as they get to interact and take part in it. And just as with Pesach, we are commanded to observe it and remember it as though we actually experienced it. As though we were there with our forefathers leaving Egypt. Sukkot is the same thing. We are to celebrate it and observe it and remember it as though we were in the wilderness. As though we lived in temporary dwelling places. As if we walked out the front door every morning to find Manhu on the ground. As if all we could do was follow the presence of the Lord visibly and tangibly in front of us. And how much more important is it today in the world that we live in that we are continually reminded of that. That we can wholeheartedly remember to follow the presence of the Lord in everything that we do. And we're not just looking to something out in the distance that we're following. But instead, it's now an internal reality that's leading us from the inside and calling us to walk along with him. And to follow him and remind us that he has paved the way and prepared the road before our footsteps. And he has already won victory over every battle that may lay before us. And so it doesn't matter how terrified or afraid we become. He's already paved the way. And it's really hard for us to share this with our children. And they ask why if we don't actually truly believe it. If we're so caught up in the mundane and the day to day in the world around us that we forget about what God is already doing for us. If we go so caught up in, in being down, down and trodden and burdensome because the load's heavy or because work is hard or because the money's not there or because the bank account's low or because the car's acting up or because of whatever else you can imagine and we're so focused on the finite here that we forget about the reality, the infinite that is there <coughs> and the reality that our finite should be wholly and entirely submitted to his infinity because he wants to provide on a daily basis. 
and he does provide on a daily basis, but how open are, are our eyes to that reality on a daily basis? And so Sukkot is an opportunity each and every year to realign our focus, to realign our reality. And we sing the, the uh, Hallel Psalms. We, we, we uh, re re respond to the Hallel Psalms. We take part in the Hallel Psalms every year so that we remember that everything that we have comes from the Lord. And so that our children can be taught everything you have comes from the Lord. And so that their children can learn everything you have comes from the Lord. And so that we can learn to be excited about the presence and the, pro the, the, the provision of the Lord as we see our children get excited. And so it doesn't matter that it's hot. It doesn't matter that it's humid. It doesn't matter that there's mosquitoes going around. It doesn't matter that any of that's happening because the presence of the Lord is here and he's moving. And look, he knew good and well 4,000 years ago when he commanded Israel to observe Sukkot that we were going to be spread around the four corners of the globe and we were going to experience every climate known to man and that we were going to be sitting under a sukkah in the middle of this, the Gulf Coast of Alabama in the middle of September, sweating our tails off, <laughs> smoldering in the humidity, crying out to the Lord the day of Sukkot beginning that please God, don't let it rain because <laughs> you never know when that's going to pop up around here. But you know what? Even in the midst of that, look at it. There's a little breeze coming through. It's not as humid at this moment as it was an hour and a half ago. The sun's down. It's not as smoldering. You're not melting. It is a little warm. You may be a little sweaty and smelly, and so is the person next to you, so you get over it. But you know what? It hasn't rained. And we got to celebrate our first uh, evening of Sukkot under the sukkah. And we got to recognize the beauty of God's provision and that his hand is ever faithful in our lives. And then when we cry out upon him, he provides. We get to hear the, the good news, the testimony, the good report of Clayton James and of what the Lord is doing physically and tangibly in his life. We get to see God's provision in a finite way, in a tangible way. And we get to be amazed as our children are amazed. And we get to be reminded as our children are being reminded of how great our God is. Gadol Elohai. How great is our God. Holy is his name. There is none like him. And the fact that he wants nothing more than for us to dwell in his presence. And to know his love and his mercy, which is renewed daily. Every morning when you wake up and breathe the breath of life, his mercy is renewed in your life. It's amazing what God can and will do. And it's amazing when we have the opportunity to enter into his presence and to see him move in a mighty and powerful way each and every year. And I pray that this year, that you don't just celebrate it these eight days uh, as we have now entered into the first day, that we don't just celebrate it these eight days and focus on it now, but that it's something that's a reminder day in and day out until next Sukkot. And the Sukkot after that, the Sukkot after that, as long as it may be before Mashiach returns, that we can constantly be reminded of his provision, of his might, of his power, of his mercy in our lives. And the fact that it's his salvation that allows us to experience his presence in a way that our forefathers could never experience in the Holy of Holies. And that he's caused us, not called us, not only to share that reality with our children and their children, but with each and every person we come into contact with on a daily basis. Avrachamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, we love you, and we adore you. Father, I pray that you do, in fact, make us like these little children to whom the kingdom of God belongs, that you do open our eyes to the might and the power and the glory of the reality of your hand day in and day out, and that you breathe new life into us on this Sukkot. Father, that we get to experience the reality of your provision and the reminder of your mercy and your loving kindness every single day of this year, of this Sukkot, and each day after leading to next, that we never forget the tangible reality of your hand in our lives. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray, and everyone says, Amen, amen and Amen.